have you heard the discourse about tweens at sephora because this has been bombarding my feed for the last few weeks now people are very upset about tweens kind of seemingly taking over the store destroying testers making a mess being rude and i get it i hear you i see you this is something i've noticed as well on my shopping trips at sephora the store looks a lot different than it did even just five years ago. The customers are mad, Sephora employees are mad, and I definitely get it. And we've heard a lot about this topic and everyone is kind of asking, you know, who's to blame? And the main answers that I hear, Sephora, some people think it's the store. A lot of people think it's just social media in general, and a lot of people think it is the parents. And while I think these all play a different role, I think this is a much larger, incredibly layered issue. And today in my Makeup Musing series, I wanna offer an alternative perspective, actually in defense of the tweens. Okay, hear me out, hear me out. Um, actually, let's start. We're gonna do my makeup while we do this, of course. So I will leave every product listed down below. Whoops, dropping things already. Cause I probably won't mention the products too, too much, but I will say I'm starting off with the Ilia True Skin Serum Foundation. Okay, I know right away you're like, Kelly, what do you mean in defense of the kids? They're just causing a mess, what's going on? I completely understand that perspective and I have so much sympathy First of all, for the Sephora employees, working retail is an incredibly taxing job. I've worked retail before and I know how draining it can be, both physically, mentally, and then on top of that, to feel like now your role includes supervising children in your store feels so unfair to Sephora employees. I also understand the frustration from Sephora shoppers. Like you just wanna go in and buy your foundation and you feel like the store is a mess. It looks completely different than the way it did five years ago. You've got kids bumping into you, they're being rude. Okay, wait, let me put my headband on so we can get my hair out of my face. Okay, before we do the forehead, I know I was about to get so much hair in my foundation. And that was my initial reaction as well, especially as I've heard this discussion growing a lot in the last couple of weeks, I was like, yeah, this is annoying. Shame on these kids, shame on their parents, blah, 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 blah. And I still think that's an important piece of the conversation, but I think we're overlooking this issue on a larger scale. And so first to dive into this, I kind of want to look back on what the makeup shopping experience looked like when I was their age, you know, when I was a kid first getting into makeup, which let me tell you, as I was writing this out in like my notes for the video, I was feeling so old. I'm like back in my day when we were shopping for makeup, but I am 30 years old and I remember first probably applying makeup around age 14 or 15. And I use the word makeup loosely, I guess more so like my journey into the beauty space started around that age, but initially it was products like, you know, maybe a nail polish or like I couldn't fully wear makeup yet, but my parents would let me get like a chapstick or a body spray. And that was really my introduction into the world of beauty. And then eventually when I started wearing a little bit of makeup, I remember I was buying my makeup at the drugstore. I would get so excited when my mom had to go pick up a prescription because I was like, oh, I can go with her. We're gonna go to Rite Aid and I can walk up and down the makeup aisles. I would be like looking through the newspaper or like the ads to cut out coupons for makeup and then like save them until I could go to the drugstore with my mom and be like, oh, I've got this coupon for two for one. I can buy this CoverGirl mascara and then I can get like the eyeliner for free. And I remember just being so excited to kind of start dabbling in makeup. And my shopping experience for makeup looked pretty similar for years to come. And you know, maybe that was partially influenced by the small town that I lived in. We did not have a Sephora. We did not have an Ulta until like after I moved away. So for me, the shopping was at places like Rite Aid, Walgreens, maybe Target, maybe Walmart. And once I got to a place where like I had my own like first real job and was making a little bit of money and could buy things myself, like the makeup products that I was buying were very inexpensive. Like I'm talking, this was when e.l.f. had a $1 line. Everything from e.l.f. was $1 and then they had like a luxury line that was $3. And I wouldn't even really splurge on the $3 products unless I like really wanted it or wanted to treat myself, but like everything I was buying was $1, one singular dollar. And it was not until I was in college that I remember making my first purchase at a Sephora. And this was like 
a big thing for me. I remember saving up, I was a waitress, and I remember saving up all my tips and like planning out what I was gonna buy. It was the Naked 2 palette. I had watched so many reviews. I was back and forth, like do I get the Naked 1? Do I get the Naked 2? I put so much thought into this purchase. I, I can distinctly remember coming home from the store with the palette. I have this visualization of opening my Naked 2 palette, sitting down in front of my mirror in like my college apartment and doing my makeup with it for the first time. It was this moment of like, oh my gosh, I've made it. I just bought something at Sephora and for me it felt like one of these big like first adult purchases you know I was I guess I don't know still a teen like very very late teens maybe 20 now probably 19 and it was such a big moment because prior to that I really couldn't fathom shopping at Sephora you know like that wasn't even something I would dream of doing it felt like a very far off thing of like oh it was aspirational like one day I will shop at this like luxury adult store Sephora and I really identified Sephora almost as this more luxury store you know that's kind of built into the identity there with the colors that they use with the brands that they carry and it just felt like a very adult place for me when I remember making that like very first Sephora purchase. So what happened in the last mm, decade and some change where we now see 10 to 12 year old girls shopping at Sephora? You know, they're going in and they're buying their Drunk Elephant, their Sol de Janeiro, they're buying their like expensive body lotions, their, I won't say Sol de Janeiro is like a super expensive body spray, but it is definitely a step up from like the Bath and Body Works body sprays of my tween years. They're buying skincare that's absolutely not necessary for someone 10 years old, like retinol and strong chemical exfoliating products. So like what in the world happened? And as I alluded to in the beginning, I've heard a lot of answers to the question, like who is to blame for the tween problem at Sephora? And I think the very easy answers that I'm hearing echoed a lot include social media, parents, and maybe Sephora. And while I don't deny the fact that all three absolutely play a significant role here, I think that we're overlooking so many factors in this. And I don't think there's necessarily like one perfect answer of like, oh, it's this person's fault. This is who to blame. I think it's truly a perfect storm of a lot of different scenarios combining at once to result in 10 and 12 year old girls spending most of their time in Sephora. And the one that I wanna spend a lot of time talking about in today's video is a lack of third places in general, okay? Now the term third place was coined by a sociologist Ray Oldenburg, and it refers to places where people can spend their time outside of their home and their work slash school if you're a kid. So those are places one and two, home and work, again work we could substitute for school if you're a kid. And the idea of the third place has been ever shrinking for a while now. And it had me reflecting back on where I was spending my time when I was around that age. You know, when I was a tween or a teenager, we might go to the mall, okay? Um, go hang out at the mall and not even necessarily hanging out in the stores doing shopping. Like we were just walking around in like the common area in between the stores. You know, there are benches, there are tables, there are spaces for young kids to congregate, to hang out with their friends at a space outside of their school or their home. And while third places aren't completely extinct, we're definitely moving in that direction and teens and tweens don't have a place to congregate the way that they might have decades ago. You know, but even public spaces like a library. Libraries do still exist, but you know, I can't speak for your city, but I know at least here in New York, there are a lot of budget cuts to libraries. They're now closed on Sundays. They're removing a lot of offerings. They're not as available for kids to come in and hang out as they once were. And you even might be thinking like, well, Kelly, malls still exist. Sephora's are normally in malls. They're not often fully standalone stores. And while that is the case, even the landscape of a mall looks a lot different than it did even when I was a kid. When I was a kid, a mall was typically like an enclosed indoor space. Sometimes it had multiple levels. You had a common area where you could hang out in between stores and that type of mall is like slowly but surely going extinct. And it's kind of being replaced with sometimes like 
outdoor shopping centers where, you know, your walk between stores, it's outdoors. You know, I live in a cold climate, can't really hang out outside of those stores. I guess, let me clarify, it's cold right now. It's not always cold, but you know what I mean. You know, there aren't necessarily spaces in this new format of a shopping center for people to congregate and spend time with one another. And this has resulted in teens not really having the same number of places to hang out as they used to. And if anything, if you were to ask me, you know, what is the third place for young kids these days? Funny enough, I would probably say the internet. You know, it's not a physical place, but this is where they're spending most of their time. This is where they're interacting with one another. This is where they're building a community. And naturally when the internet has become their third place, we're going to see consequences of that. Suddenly they're exposed to so much more media that's not even necessarily age appropriate. Again, we have very young children thinking they need to use products like retinol and harsh chemical exfoliants and lots of makeup, lots of products that would traditionally be associated with adults. They're exposed to a lot of unrealistic beauty standards, which I would say women of all ages have been exposed to, but now we're starting younger and younger and younger. And again, now we've got like 10 year olds and younger thinking they need to be spending huge amounts of money at retailers like Sephora to buy makeup because that's what we're telling them. And when these teens and tweens don't have a physical place to hang out with one another the same way my generation did, it makes sense that they're going into stores like Sephora and being kids, you know? Um, is it good that they're going in and destroying the displays and making a mess? No, do I like it? No. But it's behavior you might expect from a child, especially when we're not giving them a space to be a teen and to do teen and tween and just like young kid things. Okay, we're gonna go in with the new e.l.f. liquid camo blush. This is the shade Peach Perfect. I'm gonna be doing a video very soon updating you on this and all the other like newer drugstore makeup products I've been testing recently, so stay tuned. I think that's gonna be my next video. But in general, we've just seen a huge loss in teen culture. And I'm gonna leave a video linked down below from a creator that I absolutely love here on YouTube named Madison Brown. And she had a video titled, teen Teenagers Don't Exist Anymore. And she talked in that video about the lack of media that's available representing teens the way that it did maybe a decade or two ago. You know, think about television shows. When I was a kid, we had so many shows that kind of represented what we were going through and kind of highlighted the teen experience. You know, I'm talking Lizzie McGuire, Hannah Montana. And that's not to say shows don't exist anymore that include characters that are teenagers but the experience highlighted often looks a lot different than the traditional teenage experience. You know, one show that Madison mentioned in her video was Euphoria. And Euphoria covers a lot of very heavy topics. And that's not to say that the topics on Euphoria are unrealistic or not experienced by teenagers, but it's undeniable the shift we've watched in programming kind of designed for teens. It doesn't exist the way that it did prior. There are less stores that are like exclusively designated for teens and tweens. So now instead we see teens and tweens buying like Lululemon or other brands that we might associate with like adult clothing. You know, teens don't get to dress like teens anymore. That's like they don't exist. You just go from a kid to an adult. And so naturally when teens aren't really allowed to be teens, it feels inevitable that they'll start acting like adults and spending time in stores like Sephora. Okay, we'll take a little bit of powder. This is the LYS triple fix powder. But I also think that tweens and teens have been exposed to such unrealistic beauty standards and I can't say that this is a new phenomenon. This has been present for all generations prior, but the level of perfection that they're fed, uh, it's, it's really only ever increasing. You know, the beauty standard gets further and further to meet through the evolution of technology and the existence of Photoshop, of filters. It creates an incredibly skewed reality for a child and inevitably it makes sense that they're wanting to attain these beauty goals that are presented to them and to look a certain way to own a certain amount of products you know it's almost like makeup has become the new toy for these children you know we've replaced their dolls with skincare products and we've told them at age like 10 you should you should try this new drunk elephant serum 
And I mean, even when we look at the packaging of these products, like, yeah, it makes sense. It looks like they're marketed to children, whether that's an intentional act or not. These products have pastel packaging. They're colorful. I did an entire video about this earlier this year that I can leave linked down below, but I talked a lot about all of these new clean beauty brands, how they're utilizing a lot of the same tones that maybe a decade ago we would have associated with something for the drugstore, something for a younger age group. And we're seeing these products at Sephora. You know, if you looked at packaging at Sephora a decade ago, most of the packaging from these more expensive, high-end and luxury brands included colors that were like gold or silver packaging or sleek black packaging, felt luxurious. And now a lot of the packaging feels a bit juvenile. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but I can understand how pastel blue packaging would be very appealing to someone 12 years old, why it would feel like something that was made for them, even if it's not. Okay, I just did a bit of eyeshadow primer. This was the Milani eyeshadow primer. We're gonna go in once again with the new Natasha Denona, my mini dream palette. I just tested this out for the first time in the last video you saw from me. I've been loving this. So I think we'll start with this lighter, kind of more transition shade. This is the Singe EO6. Also think there's just been a rise in interest in skincare in general. And I would say this really started during the pandemic when people aren't wearing or weren't wearing as much makeup during lockdown. We watched a big shift among consumers to focusing less on makeup products and more on skincare products. That resulted in a lot of online content being very skincare focused. And once again, when these teens and tweens are really using the internet as that third place and spending a lot of their time on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, it makes sense that a lot of the media they'll be consuming will then consequently be very heavily focused on skincare and buying skincare products and the next new thing. and. Even going back to the initial story that I shared when I was a kid first getting into makeup, the products that I was buying were the products that people were talking about. The method in which I found those products looks a bit different. Maybe I was reading about it in Seventeen magazine or I was finding it from people on YouTube, but that's how I was deciding what to buy as well. So it makes sense when we have creators filming about products, maybe skincare related, and you have this 10, 11, 12 year old girl that looks up to that creator, yeah, they're gonna wanna buy what that person is using. Especially when, of course, the packaging kinda looks like it's made for them. And you know, I think a lot of the discussion that I've heard has placed most of the blame on parents. And while they certainly play a role and they have a huge responsibility here, I think it's unfair to place all of that weight on the parents when this is a much larger issue and they're not the only player in this problem. I can imagine the parents are just as confused. You know, we're kind of all navigating these things at the same time. And I think when we're talking about the behavior from these kids at Sephora, while I don't like it and I don't think it's acceptable, I think it's also a symptom of the pandemic and the lockdown. During some of these, the most formative years for these children, they were in isolation. I think a lot of them are just now kind of learning how to interact in public. They naturally missed out on a lot. And you know, don't get me wrong, I don't like it either. I also don't want a 10 year old grabbing a product out of my hand in Sephora and I don't think it's okay behavior or something that we should be allowing, but it's unsurprising. And the amount of vitriol I've heard towards these young children it just reminds me, I can't help but think about America Ferreira's monologue in the Barbie movie where it's like, you really can't win as a woman. And even at their, this, this young age of like a little girl, you know, from their incredibly young age, we are showing them messaging to imply that, you know, you need to do this preventative aging. The amount of times I've heard the words preventative Botox the amount of times I've heard the phrase, oh, you can never start too soon when it comes to skincare and anti-aging products. This is what these young girls have grown up hearing their entire lives. And then when they're reacting the exact way you would expect them to after being exposed to this messaging from such a young, impressionable age, 
yeah, it makes sense that they're going to go to Sephora and think they need to buy retinol and Drunk Elephant and Glow Recipe and buy makeup. It makes sense that that's what they think because that's the messaging they've heard. And then when they're reacting in the exact way that we have programmed them to think, then we're mad at them again. Like, oh my gosh, get out of my store. This is my store. You're ruining Sephora. And it just shows it's so hard to be a girl at any age, at 30, at 12. You literally cannot win. Now, I I desperately hope no one watching this will misinterpret my words as like, let the kids go crazy in Sephora, let them make a mess because that is so far from the point I'm trying to make here. Because don't get me wrong, I want Sephora to go back to normal too. I miss when Sephora was like a calm, luxurious shopping experience. But I also hope that we can understand the intricacies of this problem instead of just boiling it down to, hey parents, you need to do better, or hey social media, stop doing that, because it's just not that simple. Okay, so, so, so thankful to all the subscribers that told me the names of the e.l.f. lip liners are on the cap. I, I mentioned in a video, I was like, oh, I don't know what this shade is because they didn't put the shade names on here. They did. You need um, like a magnifying glass to read it, but it is on the cap. So this is the e.l.f. lip liner in the shade Baddest Beige. I've been loving this formula and it's only $2. Okay, now taking the Milani Fruit Fetish Lip Oil in the shade Honey Fig to complete the look. Okay, headband is coming off and I really like this makeup look actually, but I hope you enjoyed today's video and you enjoyed this discussion. I really wanted to offer an alternative perspective and I'm so interested to read your comments down below so thank you so much for watching and i will go ahead and see you in my next video bye